Hey, so I'm in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and it's about, I think it's about 12 a.m. Um, and one of the reasons I like Kuala Lumpur um, and Singapore uh, is because it's not only diverse, but it's diverse in a way that allows people to retain their own identity. And so I just had, you know, lunch, uh, sorry, dinner, a late dinner um, at an Indian restaurant, but they call themselves Malay, uh, but it's also halal, uh, which is the Muslim equivalent of kosher. And it's really interesting because as I'm walking away, <clears throat> I noticed Oyo, and Oyo is the new, it's not really a discount place, but it's the new sort of competitor um, in the lodging industry, in the hospitality industry. The idea being that most people who are under the age of 40 cannot afford to go to a Hilton or a Marriott um, or a Hyatt. And the only reason I got to stay in one of those places when I was younger was because I was going with somebody else's parents or my own parents. Um, and so you see, there's a lot of hotels out here. Uh, I think there's one that's right there. Um, and what Oyo is doing is it's basically coming in and, and you'll see a sign. This apparently used to be the Grand Mutia Hotel. And so what Oyo is doing is buying up all these places and trying to make it better, primarily by adding technology. That's the competitive advantage of anybody new that comes into any other countries is that technology. And the reason, I, the reason I'm sort of talking about this is because ultimately the differentiator moving forward will be technology. And so Jeff Bezos, when he was in India, uh, mentioned that he believes the 21st century will be the Indian century. And of course, that's because of technology um, and India's competitive, competitive advantage in technology. Um, of course, it's not a sure thing. Uh, anybody who's been to India knows that the infrastructure um, is, a, is almost a missing component of many cities uh, simply because of the way that zoning and the way that building has happened. But I mention all these things because not only because I, I want you to, I, I encourage you to come to Kuala Lumpur, um, but also because, you know, we, we are not in a position where we have any kind of actual globalization. Uh, we are, and I've said this before, we are in the first inning of a very long baseball game uh, in terms of globalization. It's another hotel. It's pretty lively out here. And this is why I like a lot of these cities is because if even though it's 12 a.m., uh, there's a lot of people outside. And, and that's, of course, because there are a lot more young people um, in places like this because, you know, if you go to a big city in the West, it's too expensive. Uh, so you don't see a lot of people, a lot of families, you don't see a lot of young people. But the good thing about Southeast Asia is that, you know, because it's still pretty cheap, you end up with a lot of the same amenities that you see uh, in the United States, uh, like KFC, although I think it's Chinese now, um, but, you know, at a discount. Um, part of that is because of the idea that the countries like Malaysia, especially anybody in Southeast Asia, uh, the, the way that they've managed to uh, jump ahead economically was based on an export model, just like China, you export. Um, and so some countries like Malaysia have pushed back um, and it hasn't worked out very well for them up until now. Uh, you know, Singapore, of course, export, almost all the Indonesia export. And what ends up happening is when you export, you have to keep your currency low in order to compete because when you ship products to a foreign country, you're paying tariffs, you're paying a lot of fees um, to make sure that your products come into the other country safely. But the reason I started all this was not to talk about currency, uh, but was really to talk about the fact that globalization for the first time is finally happening. And the reason it's so contentious is because all these little technological, all these techno, 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 technology glitches, sorry, I was sort of trying to think, of, think ahead of myself there. Um, the people finally, finally recognize them. So these aren't small um, glitches. When I was staying in Montreal, a North American company, um, <clears throat> now, of course, it's Quebec, right? So they still operate on a European system. That means the dates are reversed. The month, um, it's not the month first, it's, it's the, uh, the day first, uh, and then the month. That's how they do it in Europe. And so ultimately, when I, I, got a, I, I stayed there six, six months ago, uh, and I, I got an email asking for a survey, uh, of, you know, I think last month. And because of the gap, I emailed them and I said, what's going on? I said, somebody, you know, I mean, I didn't really understand what was going on. And so what happened was that the system, the technology system, 
<clears throat> had reversed. Instead of instead of like twelve six, you know, when it, when I booked it, um, it was essentially you know, June twelfth, and then when they but their system interpreted interpreted that whole date, you know, in terms of the survey, at least on that side of it, probably two two separate software systems. Um, ultimately, it's pretty cool. Getting a, a shave at you know twelve a.m. Um, so the system had interpreted, you know, December. It had basically mixed up December sixth uh, with June twelfth. So remember, this is a major hotel chain. It's called Accor. Uh, they own Motel Six. Just last time I checked, they own Motel Six. They own Novotel. They own Mercury. Um, they're a huge, huge company, um, and they're right up there with Marriott. If they're having these kinds of mistakes, you can only imagine what's going on at the lower level small business enterprise situation. And so, <clears throat> oh wow, another restaurant. Looks like there's a line over here, cool. Um, and, and one of the great things about Malaysia, of course, is the, is the Indian food. Uh, Malaysia is a mixture of Indian, Malay, obviously, uh, Chinese. And so the food here is obviously fantastic. You know, they don't call it fusion. They don't need to market as much, um, simply because you know, it's again, the, the diversity is baked in. So this is pretty cool, actually. Uh, a couple of tourists hanging out. We've got the batik. Oh, Indonesia. <clears throat> the guy's wearing batik, so he's probably from Indonesia. So, um, <clears throat> oh, and uh, so and this is a, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you can see it, but, well, this is an, an Indian restaurant. It smells really nice, here we go. <clears throat> And so, um, so the reason that, I, that you're, you're seeing so much contention, so much, um, so many problems with free trade, is because everyone now understands uh, these problems. Another restaurant, um, and because they understand the problems, they also understand that whoever fixes them first will win globalization. And if you <coughs> and the Indian content, you know, the Indians um, and the Indian companies are uniquely situated to fix these problems because of the large expat population. And again, because of that competitive advantage in technology. Uh, a lot of companies, um, they, they have outsourcing and that data ends up in Bangalore and somewhere in India on a server. Um, and so Chinese New Year, so you see a lot of these red lanterns. Kind of nice. And so because India has been the recipient and the fiduciary of all this data, it is in a unique situation to find out what the problems are. And what's happening with these low, you know, sort of <coughs> consumer facing businesses is that the Indian companies have figured out uh, what those problems are. They're not gonna be in a, in a position to make those kinds of mistakes that Accor did by sending me, by mixing up the French, European versus American um, date designation. Of course, China is in a class of its own. <clears throat> it has its own technology, it's not gonna make these mistakes, but as it expands and moves away from an export-based model slowly, um, or tries to move up the value chain, it too has to figure out, you know, how to resolve these issues. And it's a fancy hotel. Ah, uh, there we go. And so when we, oh, here's public transportation. Usually there's a mixture because of the poor city planning in most major cities, there's always a mixture between different public transportation systems. You have the LRT and the MRT, and sometimes there's even a tram. You know, it, it's, it's very difficult. One of the reasons it is difficult to travel uh, is because of all these different systems that have their own software. So what you're seeing now is one of the reasons, one of the reasons why China has been so successful. It's because they don't have these problems in terms of multiple systems. Privatization, <clears throat> means different systems. It means more economic diversity. But when things get spiral to a point where the systems are not talking to each other, and furthermore, where the systems have to incorporate knowledge from all over the world, you're not gonna see most companies able to resolve even the most basic questions. And because we are now in a position where people understand these issues, they also, of course, understand how to fix them. The only question is where is who's gonna have that data and who's going to be able to be in a position to fix all these problems? Because whoever fixes it first will win. Let me give you an example, um, not just the, uh, the Accor example. Um, the other example would be when I check into, into Accor, because I travel a lot, 
I'm technically considered, uh, technically should be in line for an upgrade. But of course, that's not, that didn't happen. Because it's possible that the systems uh, in Canada did not talk to the server somewhere in India, which then did not capture the data from my stays somewhere in Southeast Asia, which were used to build up the points. Even in a, even in a company that is first in class, and Hilton, a uh, US company, is first in class um, when it comes to lodging and hospitality, when I check into an American hotel, a, a, a Hilton, uh, they have, um, I don't need to put in my passport, I have the app, I, and I don't even need to, I, I mean, I just have to pick up my key, that's it. The reason for that is because the app has my passport, the information has all the information that's necessary so we can all save time. That actually is what technology is, is supposed to do. It's supposed to help us save time. And otherwise, there's no point. Otherwise, we're actually in a position where none of this matters. Lots of malls. The development model has been um, malls everywhere. Uh, everyone benefits, company, you know, taxes, uh, air conditioning, all that good stuff. Uh, it's not sustainable anymore. Um, <clears throat> so, so that's another example with the Hilton, um, where, where when I check in, even over here, you know, they, I have to show them my passport because the systems here, even though I believe they're using a Dell or a US system, um, ultimately, I, I still have to show them my passport because the systems don't talk to each other. So even though my passport is on my US iPhone, it should be linked when, based on the application to Hilton's central server. The people here are not able to figure out um, how to access it. And why? Security. Uh, the more entry points you allow globally, the weaker your security system is. And so ultimately, people have figured out the internet is not secure, has never been secure, and in fact, was never meant to be a secure system. Um, and, <clears throat> and the idea being that communication typically is not secure anyway, whether it's a, it's a landline or anything else, uh, to, to increase the chances of making sure that, that information passes on, uh, it has to be a somewhat open system. The application, of course, goes over the protocol. It goes over, it essentially says that, all right, you might be able to hack the first level system um, or interfere with my first level system, but now you've got to go into my own application, my own separate uh, software on top of this other software. It's not, it's not an exact science, but you get the point, right? They, there's now two entry points. But here's the problem. There's two operating systems. You've got the iOS from Apple, and you've got the Android. And <laughs> they can't talk to each other very well either. Um, you can't even transfer photos seamlessly from one system to the next. A lot of that is, is because of you know, a lot of that is just a competitive, competitive advantage. You want someone to be on your system attached to a unique identifier, which in Apple's case is the Apple ID, which then allows you to, to collect information seamlessly and accurately all over the world. That's why corporations have been, you know, trying to get all the data they can, location, everything, so they can figure out who's spending money, so they can basically figure out how to, I don't want to say manipulate, but manipulate is a good word for it. They can figure out how to manipulate prices to maximize revenue. That's not working either. Another example is, is I tried to buy something from a, another first-in-class company called Columbia. Um, they make, where well, here we go. Uh, they make the best jackets, uh, lightweight, everything else. Um, and so when I had a customer service problem, I realized that none of these companies, you know, have good customer service. A lot of them are trying to create machine or AI bots to deal with problems. But for some reason, the bots figured out that if they just kind of like delay, then you stop bothering them. Uh, and there's no way to really escalate. Uh, it takes a long time to escalate. No one's that persistent. Uh, because prices have come down, people would rather spend their time on something else unless they're buying a luxury product. So what has happened? The luxury products have gone up in value because they still have customer service. They have not relied primarily on, on machine learning or software uh, to cater to customers. So their information is intact because it still uses human input. The lower level people, almost all these companies, like a hotel or a, or a Gap or Nike, all these people, for the most part, if they outsourced the technology, because they're not technology companies, the whole idea is that this is not your specialty. You outsource it to somebody uh, like like an, um, like a, so many of these companies. Not not necessarily Bain, no, not Bain Capital. Um, <clears throat> those are just the banking systems that are linked. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm blanking right now, but there are so many of them. Um, 
So ultimately, by outsourcing it, uh, you end up being able to focus on your own business, your core business. We're finding out that technology is no longer able to be a sideshow. Every company is now a technology company. That's why Apple, Google, that's why the, the Amazon, Amazon, uh, these are all trillion dollar companies because every company is now a technology company. That is not what's, what was supposed to happen because ultimately every company became a technology company by outsourcing uh, a lot of the data, which again, you can see why we have so many problems. So given that we're in the first inning of globalization and everyone knows these issues, whoever has the data will win. And a lot of these companies 